So I'm here with Mitch Sturgeon, author and speaker. Thank you, Mitch, for agreeing to meet with me. Glad uh, to do it. Yeah, uh, we have uh, here a copy of his book, Enjoying the Ride, and um, I'll make sure to put a copy of the link to this at the end of our interview. But um, Mitch, I was hoping, uh, I really enjoyed reading your book, and I know a lot of people have uh, enjoyed that. I was hoping you could talk to me a little bit about something that comes up a few times in the book, and that's uh, your relationship with um, your physicians, because that comes up a little bit. Maybe talk a little bit about the story, um, your own story, and how your relationship with your physicians has evolved. Sure, sure. So um, I was referred to a neurologist by my primary care physician you know, about 20 years ago as things were starting to go wrong with my body, and nobody knew exactly why. And you know, I, I immediately uh, became enamored with, with this neurologist because I was an engineer and I was a, a problem solver and, and I went about it in a very meticulous way, you know, in, a, in an engineering world. And he was also a problem solver and he went about it in a very meticulous way in the medical world. And yeah. together we, we were a problem solving team. And I immediately got the, the impression from him that that he was my you know, well-heeled consultant, but this was my project. You know, yeah. my health was my project, my responsibility. And so, you know, that's how we've worked ever since. And, you know, through, through diagnosis, treatment, and all the the uh, trials and tribulations of trying to treat this disease, you know, it's it's remained a strong relationship. And, and, I, and I find that when I talk to other MS patients, and other patients in general, that people forget that the doctor works for you. I'll, I'll hear things like, my doctor said I can't do this, or my doctor said I can't do that. And, and I just remind people that you, you can fire your doctor. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and I haven't had to, I just hit it right in the first time with, with Dr. Muscat, my neurologist, and then with specialists later along the line. I've just, I've just had great relationships where I advocate for myself, and the doctors listen, and together we make decisions. Oh, that sounds like a, a great relationship. Actually, in the 18th century, um, I don't know if you're aware, but it really was much more a, you would hire a doctor to come to your house like you'd hire, I don't know, a contractor or yeah. uh, some other consultant. And it, it really was, uh, people were much more aware that they could fire their doctor yeah. in that way. And the, the current uh, feeling of kind of awe uh, toward the, the doctor uh, really arose in the 19th century. Yeah, when... people are intimidated by their intellect, and, and sometimes they're no help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. sometimes they're yeah. no help. Yeah. Do you find that um, the relationship uh, to uh, traditional medicine, so-called allopathic medicine, uh, has been um, a, a difficult one when... Uh, allopathic medicine doesn't have at, at the moment a, a, a great possibility for you? Yeah, yeah. I, I went into this experience with this disease thinking that we were, the medical field was well along and that most problems were solved. And then I, a reality struck that uh, it, was, it was humbling to learn that uh, there's so much still unsolved, so many things that doctors can't do for you. And that was a little bit, you know, frightening because I, I thought, well, I've got this terrible disease, but someone's going to take care of me, and nobody's going to take care of me. I have to, you know, I have to work with a doctor and, and find solutions. And we've, boy, we've tried a lot of things um, beyond just, uh, you know, I've, I've done clinical trials, but we've also done a lot of off-label stuff, and we've done some, we've tried some pretty uh, out-there treatments because in my, in my condition, there are no approved treatments so right. you you, yeah. you tend to be, take take risks and and try things and and although nothing's worked boy i've learned a lot about i've, I've seen how the sausage is made in the medical yeah. field yeah yeah and it's uh it's a little unnerving it sometimes. is yeah what do you think makes for a good doctor yeah it's that it, it's the, it's the ability for the doctor to partner with the patient instead of dictate to the patient when you know when when he asked me what what works for me you know what what's your comfort level right. with certain yeah. treatments and and actually when i go to my doctor with 
with, with my unusual disease and set of symptoms. He doesn't so much say, you know, people will ask me, you went to your doctor, what did he say? Well, he didn't really tell me. I, he asked me, how are you doing? You know, what, how are your activities of daily living affected? And, and that's more, he, he garners more information from that interview of me than he does by any examination of me. So, so we, we work together. I, I come to him with ideas that I've read about. He jokes, Mitch, you're, you're my MS expert. What, what's going on in the field these <laughs> yeah, days? Yeah. Well, so we good. have that discussion. Sounds like he's a good listener. Yeah, he's a good yeah. listener. Sometimes he comes up with the ideas. Sometimes I come up with the ideas. And, but we're always bouncing the, the pros and cons off one another and listening. And he doesn't rush me out of his office. Yeah, that's good too. Yeah. 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 And um, just one more question on this sort of branch. Um, what, what makes a good nurse? What makes a good nurse is... Uh, I think of the, the nurse I had when I was getting uh, spinal injections every two months for a couple of years. Um, and she would, she, you know, the, the doctor had a certain demeanor and it was a, a bit doctorly. And, <laughs> and when we would get together, yeah, yeah. the ability to laugh at the doctor yeah, and, and yeah. just say, you know, he's a great guy, but can you believe, you know, he's like this or he's like that. And, and so the ability to put me at ease um, and then help me through the procedure. That, that nurse, it, yeah. it was a difficult procedure. Yeah. Yeah. And for her to be there and, and uh, empathize with me, and, and you know, it, once in a while I would grimace and, and show pain, and she yeah. was comforting and informative, but she was kind of my go-between between between me and the doctor. And sometimes I would bounce ideas off her, and you think Dr. Harrison would be amenable to that, and she would explain she could she could give me a little history yeah he, he's he's not in favor of of that procedure but but he's tried this one before right, yeah. so you might approach him this way so it's, it's kind of a you know yeah. is that liaison sounds like she was a great communicator she was yeah, yeah. she was she made the whole process a lot yeah. a lot better yeah. yeah that's great um one of the other things we've been talking about in class is uh how people take on different roles um, in society, and some, sometimes those roles are shaped by um, the conditions of their body, whether um, those are conditions that they've, you know, might be working hard to become a marathon runner, or they're conditions associated with an illness that they might have. Um, and uh, so one of the chapters of your book, in uh, this chapter 23, you talk about coming out right. as uh, someone who has uh, an illness that's affecting the way your body uh, is is in the world. Uh, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about about that that transition? And it seems as though you're making the argument that that it's not sort of an, an on off switch, but rather it's sort of a, a process and maybe a kind of a loop de loop at times. So right. Do you talk a little bit about that and, and that role? Yeah, so, and, and, and my disease progression, um, there's a point where there's definitely something wrong with Mitch, but is is he drunk? Is you know, yeah. is he injured or, or why does he walk funny? And yeah. and when you're when you're Mitch in the, in that scenario, you, you're uncomfortable. You, yeah. you you should I tell? Should I put out a memo to? All my friends and all my coworkers explaining why I walk funny. Yeah. Maybe not. And so you almost wish for that badge that you know that says this. You know, hi, I'm Mitch. I have a mess. That's why I walk funny. And then that badge comes along in the form of crutches or a cane or something right. like that. Yeah. And so there's a, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing that all of a sudden you've you've got that mobility aid, and now people are, ah I understand this. There's probably something medically wrong with Mitch. He's not just drunk, um, but then on the other hand, boy, people, it's 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 tough to to go out in public with that mobility aid for the first time. Yeah. Because people, uh, yeah. You know, th then you've made this announcement. I'm broken, and then people want to, you know, they want to know more. Why? Why is he broken? How right. is he broken? Things yeah. like that. But I always found, and I've always encouraged people to to when you look at. A, 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 a adopting a mobility aid, think that the days leading up to that are some of your worst days because you've pulled back, you've stopped going to visit 
people's houses. You've stopped going to stores. You've, your world has become smaller and smaller. And then all of a sudden, one day, you get this aid, and the world opens back up again ah, to you. Yeah. And you get out, and you start enjoying life again. So the, the worst days of the days just before, you, you adopt an aid, and the best days are just afterwards. So I, I try to remind people of that. And uh, the stigma, it, it, it's more worry than it is, you know, it's, it's not really real. You, you worry about the stigma, and then all of a sudden you're out in public, you spend a couple of days. Uh, I, I liken it to when I got glasses in seventh grade. I thought it would be the worst thing in the world. You wear those glasses around for a few days, and all of a sudden you could just see better, and the stigma was gone. Yeah, people so forget about it. Yeah, so, people, so it's difficult, and I sympathize with people, but uh, I just encourage people, don't, don't um, you know, fall away from the world because you're afraid to go out and adopt one of these aids. Yeah. It's going to make your life better. In the book, you talk about um, you talk about your iBot, yeah. which is your um, your. It's not just a motorized wheelchair, but it's also got all kinds of special capabilities. Uh, you're kind of like Bionic Mitch. Yeah, this, right? yeah, yeah. It's uh, like this Android. Uh, <laughs> this chair will will stand me up. It will um, allow me to, to climb stairs. It's got a four wheel drive mode that takes me through. On, on the beach and sand, through yeah. paths and sand and all that. And so, so that was one of my, that was my very first wheelchair. And I thought, you know, when I'm out in public in that wheelchair, I, I didn't, people didn't so much pity me as, as you know, they were, they certainly weren't jealous of me, but, but it, it's, it, it was a way of saying, uh, you know, I'm, you know, this is, look what I can do. Right. That yeah. you can't do That's you for know? sure, yeah. And uh, and that eased the transition. I really enjoyed that first wheelchair, and and the and it became a conversation piece. People would walk up to me, and, and you know, it, whereas if I'm in a traditional wheelchair, they 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 might not know how to approach me, but if I'm in a, a wheelchair like that, and I've got a smile on my face, and I'm engaging, then it becomes you know a conversation piece, and and. Uh, I'm a more interesting person yeah. than I otherwise would be. <laughs> well, you're an interesting person anyway. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, things yeah, like that. Yeah, 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 no, they do. Um, one last question I wanted to ask you is um, about, as I said before, you you know have your book. Um, I know that uh, it's been great having your book come out. It was a long process, of course, writing any yeah. book is. And um, I just wondered if you had any advice for my students who are right. struggling with their papers yeah. uh, about uh, you know any kind of long project or creative project uh, especially yeah. maybe a writing project but right. uh, as, as an author yeah and, sure so people think of writing as a solitary activity and perhaps it is you know at, at its most basic but it's important that you don't try to become a writer all by yourself so I joined a writing group where we actually met and, and showing your material to others and having them show you mat their material to you, I think is the biggest, the, the best step you can take towards becoming a better writer. Involve yourself in the writing community in some way. Make sure that you, you share and you learn from others because although, like I said, the act itself may be solitary, becoming a writer, it takes, you know, to borrow a cliche, it takes a, a community to make somebody a writer. And I learned that um, when writing this. I was an engineer. I wrote technical manuals <laughs> and reports. Yeah. Yeah. And I had to learn, people had to, I had to learn from others, you know, what, how to write for the reader instead of writing for yourself. And that just takes interaction with others. So, so don't try to go it alone is my best advice, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's great advice, yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Mitch, right. for the time you've spent to talk with us a little bit. I really appreciate yeah. it. Glad to do it. All right. All right.